So good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first conversation exchange. I am Tirana Kalalkini, and I'm a curator of contemporary art here. And it is my great, great pleasure uh, to turn the floor to the Rax Media Collective, who have given us this incredible work in the next room, which those of you who have not been to the gallery yet after this conversation can please go and spend some time there. And so welcome, and this is the first of four conversations I hope you will come back again and again. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pilana. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Uh, first, the most important, please turn off your cell phones. I have just been informed to remind you all of that. Um, so, um, we are Roxmere Collective, um, Jivesh Monika Shuddha, and uh, We've been, we, have, we have been artists in residence um, at the Garden Museum in the summer of 2010. I'm honored to be invited back and to do this exhibition that um, I would urge you, as Pirana urged you, to please go and take a look at it. Um, so this, this carpet that you see in front of you, um, on the four corners of which sit four luminaries, an extension of the constellation, as it were, um, was woven um, for the exhibition. So it is. It usually sits in the exhibition. It has been removed for the duration of the conversation. It has traveled um, for the duration of the conversation from that room to this one. Um, flying carpet. It's, it's a flying carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and this carpet, uh, to tell you a little bit of the story, this conversation is the conversation is the heart of, of you know of Roxy's practice. There are three of us. It's impossible to to work together as a single as a single artistic entity if we don't talk. Conversation is a very big part of how we practice and how we think uh, being in the world is, is made more interesting. And um, and, uh, and, and the, the, the story of the carpet is that when we were here in the summer of 2010, we saw these two bronze bears, tiny bronze bears, in uh, one of the rooms in the museum. And they're really just about this big. But, um, very beautiful, this green patina, which we've been talking about earlier this evening. Very interesting posture, as if they're seated like humans. But the story of them is that they're from 2nd century BC, and they're Han Dynasty bears, and they were used as mat weights. They were kept on four corners of mats for people to sit around to have conversation. So at least 2,000 years ago, people thought that a formal conversation, philosophical discussion, uh, playing games, also games were played on those mats. It was all a very important thing, and, and those mat, mat weights um, were part of that. Uh, we decided that we would um, sort of harken back to that wonderful tradition. A carpet, a mat, was woven for the, for the idea of conversation. The, great, the bears have now far taken on a new form, because you can see Arsa Major um, in the corners of the carpet, so it is an homage back to the bears. And the white lines that you see are from an algorithm that uh, we asked a, a programmer to code. When the th three computers of rocks were pinging to the world, talking to each other. Uh, so it's really, this is a pattern of, a, of an electronic conversation. It's part of that. So this is what happens when computers are talking to each other. So all sorts of conversations going on. And uh, as, as Pirana said, there's going to be four. Louder. Yeah, okay. louder and clearer, louder and clearer. So as Pirana said, there are going to be four conversations. This is the first one um, on the idea of, on the theme of nostalgia. What, what does nostalgia take? Where does nostalgia take us? But the other three, um, you will understand why I always get confused, are um, what does intelligence do for us? That is the next one on the 25th of October. What does accumulation do to us, and why does music move us? All of these um, themes or these ideas are, are kind of the things that really uh, pulled at us from the collection in the museum and from the kind of unique space that it is. But it'll be interesting to see how they, all of these ideas get transformed across the, you know, across the across the mat with all these people coming from uh, different worlds. And I asked Shuddha to. So we're interested in how our sense of time and anchorage and space 
has been transformed in this century. And the conversations that we are having are really about time and the thickening of space, in a sense, in a sense of the next four months. So this, uh, the carpet moves from an idea in Boston to our conversations in Delhi to um, a carpet factory in Asenovgrad in Bulgaria where it gets woven and then returns to Boston and becomes the setting of the conversations. The rules of the game are very simple. Each uh, time we will invite four uh, panelists, four speakers, four players of a game in a sense, to, to throw their dice. Each will make uh, uh, an opening statement based on the questions that we have prepared and shared with them. And then um, each of them will speak, and then we will shape and direct the flow of the conversation between the four of them, and then we will invite all of you. So in a sense, then you will join the game. Um, the first conversation, this evening's conversation, where does nostalgia take us, is perhaps the most appropriate way to begin a conversation set in a museum, and especially a museum like the Gardner. Nostalgia is not an easy thing. It can be prickly, it can be uncanny, just as much as it can be sentimental and sweet. And we are going to explore all the different tastes of nostalgia. It, it's not just about being sentimental and hearkening back to your grandmother's cookies or, or uh, Proust's, you know, <laughs> Madeleine and his tea. Um, what is the distinction between nostalgia and memory? Does nostalgia tell us more about the past or the present of the nostalgist? Uh, it's, is, it, is it a question about their present or is it about all our past? Is there or can there be a nostalgia for the future? And I'm looking at Svetlana Boyne to say that because she wrote a book called Nostalgia for the Future. Um, is nostalgia a malaise or a melody? What aspects of our lives today are people likely to be nostalgic about tomorrow? We don't, we rarely think of the fact that we constitute tomorrow's past. So how, how will people look back at us today? These are some of the questions that we would like to throw by way of our opening provocations. We have, as I said, a very distinguished quartet of speakers, and it's my, it's our honor and pleasure to introduce them in turn. Anne Holly, many of you, most of you know, um, Anne Holly is the Norma Jean Hollywood director of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. She's been with the museum as director for the last 20 years, and her exemplary stewardship of this institution has seen it blossom into one of the finest museums of its kind. Not just here in the United States, we go to a lot of museums in our line of work, I dare say, in the world. Uh, <clears throat> Prior to her appointment to the Gardner, Anne Holly founded the Cultural Education Collaborative, an organization dedicated to stimulating arts, public policy, and arts education. She served as the executive director of the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, and was instrumental in the passage of new laws supporting cultural life in Massachusetts, including the Cultural Education Act. So there's a lot to thank her for in that, for those of you who are citizens of this, what is it called, Commonwealth. Svetlana Boyn, um, a dear friend, is, at, is the Kurt Hugo Reisinger Professor of Slavic and Comparative Literature at Harvard University, a media artist, playwright, and novelist. If someone were to be nostalgic about her, they'd have to think which Svetlana Boyn would they, would they think about in the future. She's also an associate of the Graduate School of Design and Architecture at Harvard University. Much of her current work is focused on developing the new theoretical concept of the off model. And that's how really our friendship dates to our chance discovery of the term off modern, which we then realized in some ways um, speaks deeply to, to our own, the impetuses of our own practice. And that began a process of correspondence. We'd never met each other before, we never knew each other, and then we got to know. Boehm's written work explores relationships between utopia and kitsch, between memory and modernity, and between homesickness and sickness of home. Her research interests generally include 20th century Russian literature, cultural studies, comparative literature, and, liter and literary studies. 
And in addition to teaching and writing, she sits on the editorial collectives of many journals. She's had many awards, um, which I won't, you know, you can all look this up, but I won't embarrass Svetlana by listing so much of them. But her books, which I urge you to read, include Another Freedom, The Alternative History of an Idea, and The Future of Nostalgia, The Future of Nostalgia. It could be said if that there was anything you needed to go, to, if there's anyone you needed to go to in case you wanted to know everything that there was to know about nostalgia that you were afraid to ask, it would be Svetlana Boyan. Um, next is Jorge Otero Pilos, sitting directly across me. Uh, Jorge is a New York-based architect, artist, and theorist, specialized in experimental forms of preservation. He is tenured associate professor of historic preservation at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture. His artworks have been shown at the Venice Biennale and at Manifesta, where we had the pleasure of working with him, and they are in the collections of major museums and foundations. His works and writings have been published in international publications such as Art in America, Art Forum, Architectural Record, Volume, and others. He also edits the journal Future Anterior, which has been recognized as one of the leading platforms of critical discourse in architectural conservation. Jorge's work rethinks preservation as a powerful countercultural practice that creates alternative futures. We talked about nostalgia for the future, and here we're talking about alternative futures for our world heritage. It is from Jorge that we in Rux learned to consider and think about the ethics of dust. Welcome, Jorge. Finally, um, David Wilson. David Hildebrand Wilson founded the Museum of Jurassic Technology in 1988 in Los Angeles, California, together with his partner, Diana Drake Wilson. He is the director of the museum, an educational institution dedicated to the advancement of knowledge. The museum holds a specialized repository of relics and artifacts, evoking some of the more obscure and poetic aspects of natural history, the history of technology and science, and their entwined relations of human artistry and ingenuity. Wilson has also produced independent films, most recently under the auspices auspices of the Museum of Jurassic Technology in conjunction with Cabinet, an arts and science-based cultural institution. He was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship in 2001 and received an MFA in Experimental Animation from the California Institute of Arts. Uh, when Piranhas first started talking to us, we had many long conversations. She said, one person you have to meet is David Wilson. There's something about the way in which you think about time and about timelessness, and about the relationship between tangent to clock time that will appeal to you when you, when you get to know David Wilson. And we hope it is our dearest ambition and wish that one day we'll visit you at the Museum of Jurassic Technology. So thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, speakers, as well as those of you who are attending, for taking your time to be with us today. Let's set the ball rolling. And to start things off, we would like to invite and Holly to make her pitch. <laughs> Ms. Holly, where does nostalgia take you? And how willing are you to be taken where it wants to take you? How does a museum like the Gardner Museum, some could say this is a shrine to nostalgia, a nostalgia for Isabella Gardner in her time, ensure that this sentiment does not overwhelm its function of also being an institution with a contemporary relevance in that. How do you resist myself? Well, that's a great question. I, the, the, the enchantment of the gardener to me has always been the creative aspect of nostalgia, uh, that here you have an individual who came from a time when there was really very little for her to have as culture in this country, but saw and picked what she could in other countries and brought back sort of a magic show for, for people who never got to see antiquities or works by Titian or Rembrandt. And so I view, have always viewed this as a generative, creative place, a place of creating wonder 
And, uh, and I've stayed away from the um, sort of um, uh, heroine worship uh, of, of what was created because to me, what speaks so loudly is the process of creation. And that, you know, to go into the, I was just standing today in the, the Spanish cloister where, you know, at one end you have this, this incredible painting by Sargent, the, the Alphaleo, which is really the most extraordinary, creative, sort of crazy dance where you see the, this, this Spanish uh, dancer and singers and all kinds of, of movement and joy and expression, and, and it's installed in a whole environment that she made up. Uh, so so you, you see this mind at work creating these installations um, from a painting, and then at the other end of this gallery is installed, again for creation, a, a memorial chapel to her dead son. And so within this one space, you have these incredible emotional responses going on of, of ecstasy and joy and of sorrow and loss. They're totally incompatible, and yet they're inhabiting and making this energy field in this space. So for me, from the time I came, I was always responding to, to this kind of energy of creation. And so I see the nostalgic um, aspect of, of using the past to create a new future um, it, exactly what's animated the museum with your work, for example. I mean, you came and found things that sparked new thoughts, new interactions, new friendships. To me, by having someone who didn't have a culture, basically, well, of course there was a culture, but not the kind of high culture that existed in Europe, who wanted to bring that to this, to, to this place, um, it, it, it just created that energy of, of recombining things, recombining times, recombining cultures, reinstalling them, and then inviting other people to engage with it too. So I guess your question, is it a malaise or a melody? For me, it's a melody, you know? Uh, and, and I don't, I, I sort of don't go there where one is worshiping at the shrine of the dead creator, but rather the energy of that creator. Um, the museum has remained unchanged, in a sense, by my mandate for the last 100 years, and you've been here for the last 20 years. Um, while the arrangement of the objects may still be governed by Mrs. Gardner's will, how has the experience of living and working with these objects on a daily basis changed your experience of them? Is there a work that you've personally witnessed transforming and evolving? Like, is there a work in the collection that you have witnessed transforming in your consciousness? Not in a physical sense, but in the way in which it appears in your perception? Oh, well, so many do, because the, the the life changes, the seasons change, but you change. Every time you are looking at something, you're really a different person than you were the day before. So there's this, this interaction. I guess I, I um, have been so um, taken with the the, uh, the um, Titian Europa and the installation of that, uh, not only because that story is so powerful, the, the Ovid story of the capture of Europa being swept away on the back of the bull. And, but the, 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 the picture, the way it works, um, Titian's this amazing powers of painting. And then um, I'm always, uh, so I'm always seeing something different in it. You, you, your eye focuses on something, whether it's the rough brush strokes or the amazing clarity of the eye of the dolphin. Uh, there's just so much to interact with. But then there's that dress, there, or there's that fabric of gardeners beneath it. That's the fabric from one of her favorite gowns, this worth gown. And I, what I, I think, what I feel is going on in this installation, in this, is one of her great creative acts, I think, because it works so well visually. But I literally, see her taking off her dress, pinning it under the Europa, and climbing into the picture. I sort of, I, I sort of think it 
it's her apotheosis. It's it's sort of what she's what she's trying to aim for in a way, uh, and and yet um, uh, and yet <laughs> it's a picture, but it's a picture of of the transformation of culture. It's a picture about the story of of the nation of of, of, of ancient civilization. So I think that one engages my mind so much. Just just you know, thinking about what she was doing, thinking about what Titian was doing, and, and just the installation. It's it's something you can go back to every day. So Nan, what do you think is the space and time of nostalgia? And space uh, and um, is uh, <laughs> taste and time. Is it uh, repeating the same question? Is it a malaise, a melody, or a madness, or a mode of living and working? Where does it take you? Uh, it's interesting. It was a very interesting slip of the tongue, whether you talk about taste or space. And the other interesting slip of the tongue was the future of nostalgia or nostalgia for the future. So that probably what interests me is what is time and tense of nostalgia, is it past, present, or future? Are we really aspiring to a future without the nostalgia? When I wrote the book 10 years ago, perhaps I was hoping for a moment when we wouldn't need nostalgia, we would just live in the present and feel at home in the world. Don't worry, that object of nostalgia is forever elusive. So for me, I really wanted to look at how nostalgia works with our affect, with our mind. Nostalgia was called hypochondria of the heart. So I was interested to figure out its dynamics and how it works with space, time, and taste. What are its inner workings? So I did a little bit of history. I wouldn't bore you with everything, but the word nostalgia itself is already nostalgic. It's pseudo-Greek. It comes from Nostos, return home, and Algia, longing. But the word was coined by a very ambitious graduate, Swiss graduate student in 1688. And it was originally a physical malaise, which could be cured, bad, but curable. It could be cured with leeches, purging of stomach, and return to Swiss Alps. <laughs> uh, so people who succumbed to this disease were Swiss mercenary soldiers who loved their country so much that they didn't want to die for it far away. <laughs> Often when they were returned back home to Swiss Alps, some of them died. Supposedly they mixed the symptoms of tuberculosis and nostalgia. <laughs> but for me it became kind of a metaphor that return home is not always a cure. So tastes were also at the very beginning of nostalgia is all this kind of small taste, sound, smells, all the senses for which we in a way almost don't have a vocabulary. But then what kind of story you make out of that? So for me, coming from Russia, being an immigrant, nostalgia is both a malaise and melody. And I began as an immigrant, as maybe many other people in this room who are immigrants, with a certain taboo on nostalgia. At the beginning, when I came to a new country, I did not want to talk about nostalgia. It was Lord's wife, never look back. You become a different soldier. So uh, for me, then, I looked at the kind of history of nostalgia, how from a medical condition, it then became a philosophical metaphor. When in 18th century, the doctor said that poets and philosophers should deal with nostalgia, it's a hypochondria of the heart. They tried to locate a nostalgic bone. I really love that. <laughs> like now, we think that if we locate a gene, we have a cure for everything. So they were looking for this place uh, for, for the nostalgic bone. Is it in your mind, in your stomach, in your heart, or maybe in the outside world? And they did not find the object of nostalgia. So I decided that as a sort of a scholar and an artist, I cannot provide a cure for nostalgia. I can only provide a typology. And in my book, I came up with only two kinds of nostalgia. But after I met Rax, I came up with a third type of nostalgia that offers us hope, makes it interesting again. So I just briefly mentioned the two and then offer us something, throw something to respond also to what Anne was saying creativity and nostalgia. So I was interested in, in the kind of two types of nostalgia. First one that emphasizes this return and reconstruction of a mythical home. I called it restorative nostalgia. 
when history becomes heritage, which is precisely what you were saying, that you wanted to avoid this kind of history, turning history into a shrine, a heroic heritage, it could be used in politics, starting with romantic nationalism to the present day. It can become quite dangerous because nostalgia seems to be apolitical, and that's precisely why it can be actually manipulated by politicians. So this type of nostalgia emphasizing space. And the taste is always manipulated, so it could go either way. Uh, so the second type of nostalgia emphasizes algia, the time, the longing itself. And Vladimir Nabokov, who never returned back to Russia, wrote that a writer can become what he calls epicure of duration, kind of enjoy the duration itself and reflect on time. So this is a creative type of nostalgia that could be called the reflective nostalgia, an opening nostalgia that plays with time, knows that there is no return, but could combine affect and irony. So ultimately, you know, because we think we're nostalgic for a place, but in fact, we're nostalgic about time. And we cannot return, it's all about the reversibility of time. We cannot return back in time. We can return back in space, in place. So that's a danger to kind of be aware of that. And often we're nostalgic for the time of our childhood, which is not even a past sometimes, but like a longer duration. It's not only about time as past, present, and future, but long time, short time. It's also pace, speed, and so on. So for me, also, I was very interested. So my other point was that nostalgia and modernity are like Jekyll and Hyde. They're together. Nostalgia is a modern diagnosed in early modern. And then I was very interested also in the idea of utopia, and it seems that nostalgia works against utopia, but it's often utopia directed towards the past. Again, having come from Russia, I tend to be rather non-utopian, anti-utopian, but not quite anti, maybe non-utopian. So then I came up finally with a more creative solution. I decided that, you know, realized that nostalgia can be not only prospective, past-oriented, Oh, sorry, not only retrospective, but also prospective. And the idea of prospective is that we can open the past like a fan, like a carpet, unfold it, and look at roads not taken, possibilities that were not explored, and work with them, crystallize them. And for me, this is really like to be called the third type of nostalgia. And that's where I moved to my work on freedom and with the founded this new movement, also together with Rats of Modern. And the idea of off, it started as a joke, came out of my art practice and became very serious, especially when I posted a little manifesto online, and then wonderful artist, Rats, responded from New Delhi. So it, started, it became real when they responded to me, really. So it was co-created through this dialogue. So very last uh, idea, and of modern also is a kind of an a recovering an old idea of Russian writer and critic Viktor Shklovsky, who said that evolution moves like night in chess. It moves in zigzags. And of means also over, belonging, and distancing. So it's a wonderful not being anti, but being in an oblique creative relationship to that modern project. And it also allows for kind of more eccentric revival of human agency. What's interesting about nostalgia, it's not post-humanist, post to use a fashionable term. So it's a kind of, of modern rehabilitates the eccentric. I was really admiring how you described the painting, also looking at some more eccentric details that also make it a work of art. But it's also this kind of eccentricity that allowed for our cross-cultural dialogues. So ultimately, this prospective dimension of nostalgia seems to be perhaps moving towards wonder and creativity. But we still should not should always be cautious about going too far in that direction. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, there is a lovely term that you used, quoting Nabokov, uh, the epicure of duration. <laughs> and I want to take that as a hinge to move to Jorge, who is a kind of epicure. He's a doctor. A doctor, a healer of duration, a curer of duration. Um, when you restore a building, uh, or any architecture or artwork, and this is more than just a question of architecture because I think it goes to the heart of conservation in the museum and practice in, in, in the 
arts. Are you trying to restore the artifact that you're working on to a timeless, pristine state? Or is there a specific way in which you locate your intention in a specific way? What decides what that time is going to be? Um, okay. Um, yeah, how do, how do we begin to unpack that? I, well, maybe just in, a little bit in response to what you said, and actually you mentioned right before this uh, conversation that you were from St. Petersburg. So uh, maybe I can just respond in terms of a current project that I'm working on in St. Petersburg. And maybe that's a way to create all sorts of other, you know, I'm, I've been trying to follow these lines and they sort of don't, I can't follow them too far. They just blend into each other. So, so maybe one of them will spin in that way or that way or that way. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the preservation architect for the restoration of an island in St. Petersburg called New Holland Island. It's an island that was built by Peter the Great to store the wood to build his ships to create a naval empire. Uh, I'm part of a big team, lots of architects, or so, you know, in a restoration project, you're always working together with lots of people, so there's no sense of authorship in the traditional sense of art, where the work is always a response to something. Um, and in the sense that there is a building there, you're responding to it, but there's also lots of other people in the conversation. It's never really the product of one mind. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it turns out that when I arrived on the project, there have been lots of other restoration architects that have tried and failed to, to restore these buildings. So I have no hope of actually doing it. You know, I will probably, you know, not restore the buildings. But, you know, the project is underway. And, um, and, and when I arrived, it turns out that it was already, uh, you know, to your question, there was a period that had been established to which this island had to be restored to. When I arrived on the island, you know, I started looking at the history. Peter the Great had done what he'd done, but then also uh, Dimitri Mendeleev had had a laboratory there, the man that founded the periodic table of elements. Where would we be without the periodic table of elements, without chemistry, <coughs> you know? Um, there was the first radio station that linked all of Russia together in this island. Um, that the White Army used to be able to communicate the Baltic Sea and, and the Black Sea. Uh, there was a testing pool where the, um, where the first submarine of the Russian Navy was tested and, you know, in a model form. There was a prison from the middle of the 19th century. There were all these things that didn't really square off to the, you know, 16th century. Um, well, it turned out that when I arrived, another previous restoration architect had demolished all that stuff. You know, everything that was in the 16th century, you know, Mendeleev's laboratory, gone, the radio station, gone, the testing. So when I arrived, the words, all this stuff, I said, well, that's not important stuff that we didn't really want to, you know, that was not in the period of significance. So, you know, so then, you know, my project, I guess, you know, when I work, I mean, my, my projects are in a, like, they're really rejects. They're not projects. They're rejects. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I, you know, and the reject in the sense that I rejected the fact that these things were not there, but I, you know, that I also want to, you know, do something that that brings back this these buildings that are no longer there. But I can't bring them back because they're gone. There's nothing there. So how to, how to do that is in a sense my problem. So so I've been working with this idea of the reject. So I guess which is linked to this problem of nostalgia, I guess, in some way, but I, you know, for me it's not projective or, uh, you know, it's more rejective. And I don't know what I mean by that, but maybe you can help me with that. <laughs> uh, you know, but, so, what I tried to do was to say, okay, so I'm working with a big team of people that are saying, okay, well now, where there was a laboratory, let's put a big contemporary art museum, because everybody, every city needs one of those. So, let's, let's put it up, and so my, work was to try to get into that some sort of reject uh, of the past. Uh, and so I tried to incorporate, I, I tried to force the walls inside that museum into the shape of the old laboratory, into the shape of the old testing pool. So you can't really, you actually, nobody will ever know, but some of those walls actually coincide with some of these things. So um, that's what I, that's what I tried to do now, is that, when you go there and you see these things and you're experiencing, is that nostalgic? 
Uh, is my project nostalgic? Uh, I don't know because in a sense it's a refusal of the recent past. Um, it's also, you know, that island was closed for, for 300 years. It was just recently opened. So nobody actually was in the island to have ever experienced Mendeleev's laboratory. So that for me is this, the interesting paradox is, you know, we all feel a part of that modern world, the origin of modern chemistry, plastics, you know, who, where would we be, right? We all, that's part of our, certainly part of my past, but it's, that island is, I can't, you know, it, it's not mine. I've never, you know, I don't have an experience of that. So I, I'm interested in a sort of paradoxical, you know, experience where you both belong to something, but you don't. You know, it, but it belongs to you. I mean, modern chemistry belongs to me. I mean, I have some plastic stuff in my body. You know, I mean, there's all, you know, I have like, uh, most of us have, uh, have uh, um, you know, all sorts of plastic in our fatty tissues. We all have, you know, remnants from plastics, right? That's the, you know, bisphenol, bisphenol A, right? We all have bisphenol A in our fatty tissues. So we all have Mendeleev stuck in our bodies. <laughs> and uh, so in a very physical way, we have them. But we don't belong. So I'm interested in this sort of paradoxical relationship we have of, you said it's a personal experience, but it's also a collective experience. Um, and and how, to, how to explain that, I, I don't know. I think of it sort of as an echo. It's sort of like my projects re reject something into, you know, something like the world. And then it comes back from nowhere, you know, that's sort of like an echo. You say, bah, and then it's... Some, it comes back from somewhere, you know, by. So what I think will end up in this island will be something that comes from nowhere. Like no one will actually be like, oh, that's Mendeleev's laboratory. There'll just be this sort of odd oddity uh, that will just sort of like be a fly in the ointment. So, and it will prevent the reduction of this island to a period of time, you know, to this, to this idea that this is the 16th century Peter the Great world. You know, so there'll be something stuck in there, but it's not clear what that is. I, it's not, you know, now, I say that at the same time when I present to the, to the authorities. <laughs> they'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they can say no, I guess they can say no. I mean, they, but so far, so good. I mean, they, so far, so good, meaning they don't say anything. We were talking about this. They just, they just sort of like look at both. <laughs> So maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, it's very interesting this idea of a time that is nowhere. Right. And and I want to use that as the hinge to go to David Wilson. Um, a no time or a time outside time. When Pirana first spoke to you, uh, us about your new work and introduced us to your work, we were instantly captivated because in our language and Bengali, uh, the word for museum is Jadukar or Ajayakar, and that sort of refers back to the older idea of the Wunderkammer, the wonder, the wonder chamber. And um, in, in thinking about the Museum of Jurassic Technology and seeing what she showed us, we were instantly taken to this, to the, I hesitate to say no, because this is such a fulsome no, it's such a present no. It's not an empty no. It's a, it's, it's a present negation of our obsession with the present time. Is the Museum of Jurassic Technology the project to which you've dedicated so much of your time, creativity, and energy an instance of the actualization of another sensibility of living with and experiencing time? Does it ask us to remember and attend to realities that will be considered by many to be obscure or arcane or weird for a specific purpose, so that we're reminded of something else within us that we usually forget. And if so, what would you say that purpose is? It's curious. Your, your question makes me um, think back to the kind of earliest days of the museum, of you know, establishing our institution as a permanent in a permanent home, which was in 1988, as you said. Um, 
in those days, even though we had done all of, made all these efforts and put all of this work into establishing the museum, we had no idea if anybody would ever come. And for the longest time, nobody did come. But somehow, in those earliest days, a fellow from Italy, a fellow that worked for RAI, which is a large Italian um, uh, television network, found us, a fellow named Rafael, Rafael Siniscaldo. And he, he just came, knocked on our door one day, and said that he wanted to do a um, half-hour television program on us. We were astonished because we didn't think anybody had ever heard of us. But somehow, he found us and came in, and he and his crew shot for, oh, three or four days. And then, just before they were to leave, Raffaello and I sat down and, on camera, did a conversation. And the conversation seemed to go remarkably well for someone who had never done anything like that before in his life. But at the end of the conversation, kind of the, the clincher, the clincher question, Raphael looked at me and said, so is this a museum about nostalgia? And, and I just kind of went quiet. I had no idea what he meant, and I was kind of horrified at the thought, because it certainly had nothing to do with how we understood our work. Yes, we drew on the past extensively. We were quoting from the past. We, um, we had a lot of um, you know, historical reference for certain. Um, but to think of it as nostalgia, it seemed like a pejorative term. It, didn't, it seemed like not the right way to look at it, this, all this effort of ours. And I think I just mumbled something, stumbled through, and then they turned the camera off, and it turned out they cut around that part. We never had to deal with it. <laughs> but, but, and they produced a beautiful documentary, actually one of the best film pieces that's ever been done on us. Then a number of years later, um, that still haunted me, and I remember looking into, uh, like we're thinking more and more about nostalgia, the place where I started to, um, you know, try and understand where it came from. And like Svetlana, I came across the origins of the word nostalgia, which really does mean um, essentially home, homecoming sickness, a sickness about homecoming. So it's more a sickness about home than it is about, to me, about a time, in a way it's more about a place or um, I think in my, in, my, in my feelings, maybe it's because I'm wanting to um, disassociate our work with um, this, that term that I still feel, feel is pejorative, sorry, nostalgia. But I, I immediately, when I came across that definition, I came, the, the home that I understood was but in a certain way, a more spiritual home, you might say, like drawing on kind of the Gnostic idea of what home is, which is kind of the place from which we all come, a place to which, um, you know, we have been tricked into this existence that we're in, but that we are all in some way longing to return to. And from that point of view, all of a sudden, I understood what Raffaello meant, just like, like crystal clear, and it made perfect sense to me. So, um, in that sense, I could understand how you might think about it as a form of nostalgia. Um, I think, in some way, to try and actually answer the question you asked, which I just didn't do at all. <laughs> but, which I've learned is the best way to answer questions. You can say <laughs> what you want to say anyway. <laughs> but we, we do, our museum does certainly reference time. And, um, but rather than, I think, looking back to time, we, we've drawn a lot on the 17th century. We have kind of one of our 
large and kind of most elaborate exhibitions. It's on a 17th century Jesuit named Athanasius Kerger, who is, you know, by now become kind of a household word almost. Um, and Athanasius Kerger, yeah. The last man who knew everything. <laughs> the last man who knew everything. Um, so we, we've drawn a lot on the 17th century, we've drawn then on the 19th century, on the kind of enormously interesting period of time when um, science was coming into direct collision with religion and the, and the difficulty that that created for you know, people on all sides of that equation. But I don't think that we look back to any of those times as a time some way better or more desirable. I think instead, we, I think that's what we're looking to is um, by like calling up or conjuring those eras and those people, often many of the exhibits in our museum have kind of biographical overtones. Um, I think that it's what we are doing by conjuring these people is more just calling attention, I think, to the ways in which those projects failed. And by, hopefully, I think we feel by uh, connection, be able to understand how our projects failed too. How it's, it's wonderful to look at 19th century science and the kind of certainty with which people felt their, their knowledge. I mean, they were just, moments away from knowing everything, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and today, you know, you hear, you hear similar, similar questions, which is really, we have all of the last details, and then we'll finally know and understand everything. Well, that, from that point of view, it's really wonderful to look back at kind of how those projects failed and maybe come to question if these, if these, if these projects or certainty of our own might be, you know, possibly be failing in the same way. I think an, another thing that I had thought of when you were asking your question about time is that I think that that time is, 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 a, is a, our strata. And I let's see if I can make this kind of correlation. Oftentimes people ask about people that come to visit our museum, are they from a certain kind of social caste or, you know, uh, a certain cut in society? And it's what we find is no, they're not. They're not people of a certain social economic background. They're not people of a certain educational background. Um, it's all kinds of people, but it's not, which isn't the same thing as saying everybody likes, likes our museum, because actually the exact opposite is true. A lot of people hate what we do and are pretty vocal about it. <laughs> but we find, but it's what we find is that if, if social, economic, you know, privilege, lack of privilege forms strata, that there are cuts that go the other way. And in those cuts, um, There'll, there'll be people from, you know, the least privileged to the most privileged. There's a kind of a, a, a core that, you know, that respond to what we do. And then outside of that, so many other people that don't respond to what we do. And in the same way, then thinking about time, there, you know, in purportedly things evolve over time. There are changes over time. But I think that we were also able to like look back and, and if time is this horizontal strata, there are also vertical cuts that can be made, can be made where, where we can feel absolute affinity to somebody that was working you know, in the 17th century or in the third century, but certainly not everyone and not a particular time, like necessarily not and it's an even as if there are certain times that are more sympathetic than others. I wanted to
take that idea forward because I think what you're saying is really interesting. That there seems to be a, a certain recognition that you can find mutually of people who have this sensibility. Um, you know, the, your, those, who, those who come to your museum and you recognize them instantly. Um, I know that there is an expert in your museum about this ant that has these spores that, that, that infect it and then they, they they compel the behavior of the ant in a certain way. And I sometimes think that those of us who are artists or work with the imagination are in some ways ants infected by these kind of spores. Not that we are looking back at another time with awe or, um, or, or in, uh, in, in humiliation of ourselves, but perhaps a sense of being in transit not necessarily saying, oh, that time is better, or this time is worse, and that time to be will be better, but a sense of constantly ourselves being in transit, uh, somewhat waiting for trains to leave and, and arrive, in times of our own choosing. Are you in a time of your own choosing? I should, I should point out that really the um, end of that story is a sad one because the <laughs> ant that infects the spore does nothing but climb up, impale his mandibles, and then die. So, <laughs> I mean, we feel too that, you know, we've been accused of having inhaled spores as well, but it's not always such a happy ending. Um, I like the idea of, of, of transiting time very much. And, um, and I think, I think actually that's something that, you know, in my most inner life, I do. I mean, I go back and forth in times, you know, through reading, of course, but just through any ways possible to try, and maybe just to try and find something enduring in time. I'm not positive what it is, but I, I'm very much um, drawn to that. is uh, a, a way to, to express dissatisfaction, you know, with the moment that, that you are not happy where you are or in the moment that you are. Um, the thing that happens with, I think, a lot of the discussions about nostalgia is that that, that, that feeling immediately gets, gets sort of reified into an object. You know, this, this, this is heritage, therefore nostalgia. It's therefore about going back to that time. But nostalgia can also be, have no object, no home, no direction. You know, it can just be like, I, I'm not happy here. You know, I wish I was somewhere else. Where is home? You know, where is that, you know, there is no, I mean, there is no such a thing as, you know, as you said, you know, you go back and die. I mean, there, you, you, so, but you can certainly express that, sort, that dissatisfaction. And, and how you do that, I think, can be very uh, positive because you can change things. Uh, you know, but, but I, I agree with you that nostalgia is a, 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 a sort of a derisory term. But, um, I mean, this carpet is sort of nostalgic of the stars and stripes. <laughs> right? <laughs> or Jasper John's. <laughs> right? I mean, it, 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 and yet, it has nothing to do with it. But what is amazing is, uh, I guess what, what, for me what's important is that there is no such a thing as a sort of, you know, like when you say you talk to people in, you know, in the 16th century, you know, I believe it. But the idea that that would be difficult, and some people might feel that's weird, I don't understand because you talk, we talk to one another in exactly the same way. We mediate through objects. I mean, we have this carpet, we have, our clothes, our things, I mean, we, we don't, there's no such a thing as a sort of, you know, pure, in the present communication. While you were talking, I was thinking about something else, you know, then I came back to the conversation, I was time traveling, well, you know, and then I came back. So, but it, I, these things ground us, and, you know, so, uh, I think it's how to recapture that dissatisfaction in a way that doesn't locate it, and still use objects, as a mediating device, I think it's uh, uh, maybe what the challenge might be. Can I ask you a question? Why, why does 
God always carry with us a sense of dissatisfaction because longing is not necessarily the same thing as dissatisfaction, is it? Well, I'm not saying always. I'm no, no, I know. Yeah. But often, especially in the kind of common usage to be knocked out, it kind of is uh, well, a melt. both of you, that what I hear is a common theme, perhaps two themes, one is time travel and the other is kind of elective affinity that might not be located in a specific space or time, but which you create across geography and history. Of course, I immediately want to co-opt everybody into off-modern for a second, <laughs> but what, when I visited David's museum, it was an amazing experience. I never left it. I stayed for the whole day and I canceled all my appointments saying I'm in the Museum of Jurassic Technology. They thought it's the most ridiculous excuse. <laughs> but, um, yes, but what um, they asked me, Jurassic Park, I said, no, the opposite of Jurassic Park. But what struck me in David's museum, in David's museum is that it was, if it was nostalgic for anything, and I like this idea of it not locating specifically, it's for the moment when arts and sciences were together, where wonder and science and arts were together, they were not separated. This was one thought that really struck me, and the other thought that really struck me, they, we started to talk about rejects and failures and so on, but there are also what I would call branches, roads not taken. And for me, like this Kirchner Baroque theater <laughs> that has these waves, your museum kind of opened this possible waves. Like I remember the exhibit of X-ray flowers. So like using technology for non-utilitarian purpose. Having like sort of technological roots that did not lead to what we call progress necessarily. But perhaps one day we can pick up one of those <coughs> bifurcating roots and do something, crystallize it in our present. So for me, it was really like an opening as a past, as a fan, with its potentialities. And some things that we call failures might be those kind of potentialities. So the off, the oblique, would be like a good uh, metaphor. And for me, what you're describing, I really am very interested in your project, very happy you're doing it, because I think it's the, I was also working on the restoration of Sistine Chapel, but beyond that, there is always an idea of restoration as restoring one time. And that's for me an example of what I call restorative nostalgia, which is very, very dangerous. It's actually kind of anti-historical. And in Russian context, the restoration of the, um, the Church of Christ the Savior is one of such examples where they demolished all memories of the time and the past in between. So it's very important to interrupt that kind of restorative nostalgia. And I think, again, with my term of reflective, just bringing in other times, I think it's extremely important to kind of interrupt that sort of seamlessness and reinvention of the past. That alone would be an important critical enterprise. And I think the idea of like just revealing palaces, that they were many histories, is also incredibly important. I think so Then they can be many futures. Otherwise, you kind of limit your future by producing one version of the past. I'd be curious, Svetlana, to hear you um, fantasize on uh, a, a creating a museum without nostalgia. Uh, what would your What would your imaginary museum be? <laughs> this is so exciting. <laughs> Since I'm not even an architect, I really can fantasize. Well, again, for me, nostalgia can be, was negatively valorized, especially for by modern critics like Adorno and so on. For me, if it's a reflective nostalgia, it can work to, with, a with a critique of the present, actually. So my ideal museum, of which I often fantasize, <laughs> would be actually to use something of the existing structure. It could be a, a main of industrial building, the foundation of Mendeleev lab that no longer exists, a wall, something of the past, some kind of a ruin, and then not to keep it as a ruin under glass, and not to destroy it, but work with it. Um, you know, and maybe combine different kinds. Create a modern museum, but also working with an element of the past, to create this kind of 
very exciting but heterogeneous building that's not entirely pure, but has this kind of tension in itself, has an archaeology inside it. So they have various images of it. that is one of the most famous architectural buildings that was never built. And I thought of it as a kind of ruin and construction site. And for me, it's a very powerful model because it has vectors in all directions. So if you work with the past or reveal some kind of a palimpsest of the past, I mean, if I name now architects that I like, it would spoil the idea because you might react to specific projects. I know about that one. But I, so I want to keep it without names. But something about keeping this past the kind of palimpsest as a taste, texture, material, but not try to make it complete and then build something modern. So maybe what you're doing is close to that. And I think in the history of Russian citizens of Petersburg is an amazing city, but it, I worked as a tour guide um, in my youth, and I always had to make sure that the tourists don't look around in the windows. Because the idea was very, was very goal-oriented. I always have to say, this building is of a decadent 19th century style, there's no architectural art. <laughs> so my idea was like, don't look to the left, don't look to the side, don't look off, just look in front, or we're going to see the greatest ensemble ever built. Totally perfect. As long as you didn't look <laughs> and didn't leave the bus and went to the yard and looked for behind the facade, you could see perfect ensemble which creates really kind of a dangerous self-conception. So I think maybe what you're doing, so for me the ideal museum would be something that has that process of the past and very attractive to the sense of viewing the presence of the past in the building um, and then teaching various, but maybe I should mention what I'm thinking about. But something like that. I mean, this is kind of a very interesting museum we're in because it's a museum. such a big question then. <laughs> <laughs> like David's museum is very hard to find. Excuse me. Finding it is part of the attraction. Invisible. <laughs> I would have loved to have been on your tour of St. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would you have done? <laughs> what would you have done when it's sort of done? I would have zero. done exactly what Svetlana told me to do. Look in front of the stone. Well, there, I mean, there is a, you know, in order to have an object that stands in for himself, you have to put blinders. I mean, and those blinders can be anything. They, you, they can be a bus, but they can be um, your predisposition to see certain things, you know, because of your upbringing or your education. They can be sort of your expectations of something. So we all walk around with those blinders, and they're, they're, they're useful way to be able to make sense of the world because if we were to have no if we were be able to take everything in it would be so hard to actually make sense of it I mean we have to edit stuff out uh, all the time I mean uh, the only problem I think is is that we invest ourselves in the past unevenly not only personally but as civilizations I mean <coughs> you know the Enlightenment invested itself in ancient Greece So that, for me, is sort of a blinder that we, you can have a difference with regards to the society you live in, right? But, but it doesn't mean that, that blinders are uh, not useful in a way. It's just sort of becoming aware of the way that you're operating within that. Uh, one thing that, uh, because you just talked about enlightenment blinders, it's just because this museum, and yesterday we were talking about this museum, uh, over the last hundred years have uh, almost decreased in light by 50%. So it would have been a very much brighter place. But now slowly, because the objects need in, in the sunlight, the object will deteriorate faster and the tapestries will lose their color faster. So it slowly, slowly just... So in a, like, yeah, objects
just need darkness to survive or they don't need light. <laughs> and in the next 100 years, in 150 years, they become, actually may become a very, very dark museum. You know, <laughs> very, very dark. And that, uh, and that was what, something that inspired uh, us to think of darkness very differently. I was just curious about the, about the light of nostalgia, in a sense that asking about what, when you talk about nostalgia, like, like utopia, when you talk about utopia, people always will find it's very brightly lit. It's there in the texts of Utopia, and it is also a lot of people's vision of Utopia is a kind of it is an erasure of darkness. So I'm just curious about the lighting condition of nostalgia in the sense that how do you produce what kind of illumination you see in the restorative or prospective nostalgia? Okay, this is such a very beautiful question. And your work is so beautiful. And inspired by your work, I would say that a light of my reflective nostalgia, of course, is going to be shadow play. Neither light nor darkness, but a spread of shadows that might give you lucidity, not complete illumination, but a certain kind of lucidity. And I associate this total transparency and total illumination with a kind of utopia of any kind, like socialist realist paintings of the 30s, uh, objects and people were not supposed to cast shadows. So they would do perfect academic painting and remove some shadows. Um, so that kind of total readability and transparency of the world, but even discourse of transparency, sometimes I worry a little bit because there's something a little bit of it could be authoritarian about it. But I don't want to idealize darkness because for me the two extremes is like complete progress or complete restoration of the past, this kind of new design of the 16th or 17th century. You know, so I think I like shadow play. We don't have enough shadow play. And that's for me the kind of, you know, re reflective light of nostalgia. And it's not a digital light, but something, yeah. I think the shadow play, looking at shadows. Is that's exactly what Ralph is doing exactly. in the other room. Yeah. 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 And Jorge, what kind of light do you see? <coughs> some sort of night vision glasses, you know, <laughs> that, that, that would be my lighting condition would be a sort of different spectrum of light, you know, that you would be able to register heat or, or a different way of actually seeing, you have to invent a different way of seeing these things, and that's, you know, uh, so you can never really get the object even in, in, even in art, I mean, you, you, but you get a different spectrum. I, uh, that's how I would, that's how I imagine, but very literally just sort of presenting myself with the problem of walking into a sort of black, dark museum but still having to see the objects, you know, that's, that's what I would do. Uh, and then that opens up all sorts of different possibilities because then, you know, what would be the boundary of the object would be sort of not clear, you know, what, what you know, labels and things like that. I mean, as you know, I work with smells a lot, so, you know, what would be the smell of that place um, is, for me, more important than what you would see, um, because that's something that's really, um, you know, light, you can always have some sort of representation, you can always sort of, uh, you could come out of that black museum and then show pictures of how it was in the 21st century, you know, and look at what they did. And, but, but, but smell, like, you're either there or you're not, so there's this sort of real difficulty in representing smell or recreating smell. Uh, so I think that that would, you know, that's, that's where, and, you know, that's, that's where, for me, that would, you know, that you, can, you, can, you can figure out the state of decomposition of an object by smell, you know. I mean, that's what we do with when we're going to eat, right? So, you know, what would be the the state of decomposition of this dark museum, what would it smell like? I'm so fascinated by that. Smell is also brings us to the present. Smell is also about the short duration of time. And I think there is something about nostalgia that we're also nostalgic for fleeing present. And working with my students, for them present fleeing, fleeing faster and faster. 
with all the digital devices and multiple stimulation. So introducing them, like I have to give them a task, walk around the city slowly, not like the dandy 19th century work with a turtle. I'm just <laughs> don't walk with a turtle necessarily, just walk slowly without the girl. That's a very new activity. So you kind of slow and go to the library and get a book. I don't know what do you mean get a book, where is the PDF? Is the PDF? Yeah, I have to give them assignment, go to the library and get a book. And some books were even published in magazines. It's amazing, you feel it with smells, and they bring a book with smells. I don't think it's a massage of this, and I think I'm really, you know, it's, it's this extending their presence to that you can move slower, and maybe that would be healthier. So I think there's something about presence. While, while smell brings us to the present, there's also nothing that triggers the past or memory like smell at the same time. <laughs> I'm going to take this opportunity to extend the present and extend the parameters of our conversation and invite all those of us who've been listening with such wonder um, to begin uh, jumping in. So if there's a question right there. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, my question would actually be um, in terms of time and one's own memory, especially being in an institution, a home such as the garden itself. What does this panel, and I would direct this more towards Anne, um, what does the panel and Anne believe the idea of a digital collection would bring to even the thought of Isabella Gardner herself, of the institution, in terms of how that would change the nostalgia of this place? How would it actually be good? Because of the idea that light is something that you cannot exactly change in the future, you have to try to work around it, or because one person would not necessarily get to see a collection, would not be able to use those senses such as smell, get the depth and feeling of a great institution like this, would it be a bad thing? You mean a digital collection to digitalize it and put it on the web so that anybody can access it? Correct. Yeah. Well, I think that's. A, I mean, I think that's one of the things we're trying to do, um, and have made a small attempt in the current website to, to have rooms that you can enter and um, also call. We don't have all the objects on the web, but I think it's very important to have that. I don't think it's the same experience, and I think. Being able to have the experience of of coming and having different kinds of daylight, different kinds of seasons, um, different kinds of sounds, hearing people practice in the galleries or make music in the gallery. I mean, there's a whole life to experience that um, one could never have digitally. Um, but um, I, I I just see it as a as a compliment. Not as a um, either or. But David. We've had at our museum a very difficult relationship with even though the word technology is in our name, it doesn't modify our report. So um, we've had a very difficult you know, relationship to technology and <coughs> While we, I mean, I think we had a website up within the first, you know, 10 days of websites to be launched when the World Wide Web, it's never been something I've been even remotely comfortable with. I don't want to say I hate it, but it certainly is not my, fa my favorite thing. I think of a handful of museums I know that are irreproducible digitally or any other way. The gardener is absolutely at the top of the 
this. I mean, to you know, the experience of the place of this place <coughs> is so profound and so deep that to try and capture and recreate it in some um, you know through bites seems not crazy.
to, and you are thinking those objects, those life, those relationships. And it's a museum, very specific museum, because it doesn't have any chronology and doesn't give you text to tell you this, that. So for us, we have to work out our own relationship, how we are to engage with certain uh, in, in intellectual dilemmas that are produced. And one was a strong current from our standpoint <coughs> that would flow in, in whatever way we would approach any, uh, any, any object, anything. So for us it was a, like all the four concepts that we're using are somewhere connected to our kind of their poles by which we try to construct a series of investigations. So you, you can say we are at one level investigating nostalgia and not so much we can engage in with how to investigate that form. Um, but also I'd like to add that, you know, that we've repositioned the three tasters and um, that's the, that there's a reason why we're thinking constantly about the three tasters. Of course it's to bring something back from the past, in general, the 17th century from which it comes, from the past where it was in the museums, it was in a stairwell to another time. So it's too removed, in a way. But at the same time, it's also immediately saying, there's an image which says, three people are tasting something and it tastes different to them. And I mean, I think that what we've been having in this conversation is that nostalgia which we sometimes think we know what it is, but it's not necessarily the same thing to everybody. I mean, there's an undercurrent of even a sense of a nostalgia, my slip of the tongue, nostalgia for the future. Um, what would that feel like? Because some people may feel that they're actually at home in the future, not necessarily at home in the past. So if they're homecoming sickness would be a sense of constantly arriving or at the edge of arrival of tomorrow. So to respond to your question, we, th we thought about nostalgia and we realized like everything else we do, we have different perceptions. And it's the exploration and investigation of these different perceptions <coughs> that even then leads us on to a situation like this where we invite four people and then all of you come, and so the conversation keeps expanding and the taste transforms. How does it, how does it transform or things that we, uh, we found or tried to restore are a direct result or a derivative of uh, the times they were created. And when we are trying to restore them, uh, we are we creating uh, that the same effect that actually created the objects. We, when we are trying to uh, restore the objects, we're uh, 
we will perceive um, in, a, in a new sense than what they were actually created for, or the result of. You know what I'm saying? And then, in that sense, uh, are we creating a, a, a future of nostalgia? Or instead of, is, is, it's definitely not a result, because the, that object or, or, or a thing, or let's say building, is actually a result of the times that was created. And now, what we're trying to do is create that, and we are looking that, because we're definitely, and most of the times, we rip the, the, uh, the object out of the context, like sociocultural aspects of that object was created in. And, and taking without that- it, Without the context. Yeah, and taking that further a little bit, um, how would we, or how would people in like 30 years or 40 years from now would be able to recreate objects from time, you know, what we are in by electronic objects? They certainly can create public spaces because we don't have public spaces that are, that were existing like 1600, 10, you know, years ago that, you know, parks and uh, with specific objects and, and all that stuff. Or, or if you go further back, Colosseums, that were results of time or events, mm -hmm. right? Now we don't, we are moving more into digital space, you know, digital uh, times. Uh, now somebody has to recreate this time, then they have to look at objects. Well, I mean, one of the things, it's an interesting question, I don't, maybe in the future they just will not be interested in recreating anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so that's a possibility too, they just might not care. So, um, you know, we didn't care for a very long time. It, it, we didn't really start caring about reconstructing stuff until the late 18th century, so it's relatively recent. And it'll probably disappear at some point. There's, it very likely will be a civilization that will not reconstruct stuff. So it's almost like a fantas our fantasy of the future is that we will be reconstructed, but you know, very <laughs> unlikely actually. So. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, uh, that answered the second part. But the second part. part. Sorry. So well. not enough to think. You know, um, I think, to be honest, we're, we're extending our time um, a lot. So maybe we can talk outside, um, catch them. I mean, I'm really, but I think it's half past yeah. eight, right? And thank you all. I mean, this is very abrupt, and we could go on, but I feel there's a kind of, yeah, people are needing to get out of here. So thank you so much, everyone, for tonight.